Welcome to review lecture number 15, part of our online review course of undergraduate probability and statistics. I'm Chris Mack, your professor for this class, and this is a lecture on the topic of correlation, the first of three lectures to cover correlation and regression, the last major topic of this review course. To begin, let's define the term bivariate data. Um, bivariate is a fancy word for saying two variables. Data from two variables uh, is bivariate data. They're generally thought to be related, that is, they're sets of pairs, x and y. Um, it could be um, the uh, amount of money somebody earns as a function of how old they are. Um, so the same person has these two attributes, the amount of money they earn and their age. That's, those kinds of things are considered bivariate data. Of course, uh, sometimes these things won't have uh, any correlation to each other, and discovering whether there's any relationship between the two pieces of data in the pair is part of what we're up to in the next few lectures. Uh, and that is on the next bullet. Frequent task is to understand if there's any relationship between these two variables, and if there is, what's the nature of that relationship? We have two very important tools that we use to help us understand the relationship between uh, two parts of a bivariate data set. The first is the XY scatter plot, which I think everyone knows what that is and why it's valuable. And the other is regression, including the calculation of a correlation coefficient. Mm, that's the topic of today's lecture. Correlation is defined as the strength of the linear relationship between two quantitative variables. Uh, before going on to calculating a correlation coefficient, there's several kinds of correlation coefficients that people use, but we're only going to deal with one of them, the most important or most popular one. But before we do that, I'm going to show you how we can convert all of the data in our bivariate data set into z-scores. We've seen what z-scores are already, but now let's consider a pair of, a set of pairs of, of data, xi and yi, i going from 1 to n. For all of the x, I can calculate the mean value of all the x parameters, uh, data points the mean of the y of all the y data points, and I can calculate the standard deviations of all the x data and the standard deviation of all the y data. From that, I can take every individual data point xi and convert it to a z xi, a z score by subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard uh, deviation. Well, the reason for doing that will be to aid in our understanding of what a correlation coefficient does uh, because we're going to create a scatter plot and help us understand physically the meaning of correlation uh, coefficient with respect to this scatter plot. So here's a scatter plot and because we've normalized everything, the middle of the graph is going to be 0, 0 right? because we've subtracted off the mean. And the range uh, of the data is going to be, uh, you know, on the order of plus and minus two, uh, as we see here. For larger sets of data, we can get up to, you know, plus and minus three, uh, etc. Uh, if if I had a thousand data points, I might see some a couple of those data points larger than plus and minus three. So um, we have a fairly well-known range in y, a fairly well understood range in x, and a center that is always at zero. That's what converting to z-scores does for us. With a picture like this in mind, let's define our correlation coefficient. There's actually several different types of correlation coefficients we can define. I'm only going to talk about the most common, the most important one, Pearson's sample correlation coefficient. In fact, it's so commonly used that it's almost always just referred to as the correlation coefficient, as if there were no others. But in fact, uh, there are some others that people use as well. This is also called the product moment correlation. And here's what we do. 
For every data point i, we multiply the z-scores together. Then we sum up all of those and divide by n minus 1. All right. This is why we would call it a sample correlation coefficient, because we're dividing by n minus 1 instead of dividing by n, as we tend to do with samples versus populations. And uh, it's the product moment correlation, because we're taking uh, the product of the z-scores and then summing those up. Uh, here, here's the full uh, definition. If I uh, um, you know, get rid of the definition of, of z. Now, what is this? What does it mean? Well, consider our graph of z-scores here. Everything's centered about zero, and we have four quadrants. In the first quadrant, of course, both zx and zy are positive. In the second quadrant, zx is negative and zy is positive, etc. Now, I'm going to multiply these z-scores together. That's the if I pick one of these data points, I'm multiplying the x coordinate by the y coordinate. If I'm in the first coordinate, excuse me, the first quadrant of this graph, the product of the x coordinate and the y coordinate will be a positive number. If I'm in the third quadrant, the product of the x and y coordinates will also be a positive number. But if I'm in the second or the fourth quadrant, the product of those z-scores will produce a negative number. Well, just look at what we've got in this graph. I've got a pretty strong correlation here, a uh, linear correlation where um, the data is moving from the lower left to the upper right. That means the vast majority of the data points are in the first or third quadrant. We see only a couple of data points right here that are in the second quadrant. Just so happens none in the fourth quadrant. Well, what does that mean? That means all of these data points are contributing to a positive sum for the z-score. And only a couple of the data points are subtracting from that positive sum. The more data we have that's lined up in a linear way, the larger this product of z-scores becomes. Now, we could have a linear correlation going down as well, starting in the uh, second quadrant and moving down to the fourth quadrant. That would just mean that most of the data points would pr provide a product that's negative, and only a couple would provide a product that's positive. And what we would see is an R value, a sample correlation coefficient, that is less than zero, negative. Let's discuss some of the properties of this correlation coefficient. First of all, R is dimensionless. It's independent of the units on X and Y, uh, and that's because our z-scores are dimensionless. R is independent of what is labeled X or Y. It's completely symmetric. You can call one X the other Y or switch the labels around. It makes no difference from the R perspective. R is always between minus 1 and 1. It can never be have a magnitude bigger than 1. If the magnitude of R is equal to 1, that means the data is forming a perfect straight line. So that's the extreme case of perfect correlation, perfect linear correlation, so that we get a straight line. That's why we interpret R as a measure of the linear relationship between X and Y. And because of the symmetry, I can flop X and Y around and get the exact same value for the correlation coefficient. We have to understand that correlation is not causation. We, if we see a strong correlation coefficient, it could be X causing Y, or it could be Y causing X. Or, in fact, it could be some independent variable, z, let's say, uh, that is causing both x and y. We call that a lurking variable. So we can't conclude anything about causation uh, when we observe correlation. Here's some examples of correlation. Uh, here's uh, r equal to minus 1. You see, it's a perfect straight line. It happens to be sloping downward. Here's r of 0. Uh, 
it's pretty much random scattering of data points. There's no general trend to be observed, and I see r equal to 0. Here's r of 0.5. There is a general trend. I have more data points in the bottom and uh, first and third quadrants than I do in the second and the fourth, but it's a pretty weak relationship. There's a lot of scatter. And as r gets bigger, the spread of the data goes down, and it approaches more and more of a straight line. Of course, when r equals 1, I would have a perfect straight line. But r, we have to always remember, is a measure of the linear relationship between x and y. Here's a graph that obviously shows a strong relationship between x and y. It's a parabolic looking uh, behavior. But if I plug this into the calculation, I will find r equal to 0. In other words, while the variables are highly related, there is no linear correlation between them. So just because r is 0, you can't say that that means there's no relationship between the two variables x and y. This is why a graph is always essential. If you're going to calculate a correlation coefficient, never do it without also graphing the data so you can see what it looks like. A related concept to the correlation co coefficient, and in some sense a preliminary concept uh, that we haven't talked about yet, is the covariance. So let me define covariance, and then I'll show you how it relates to the correlation coefficient. If I have two random variables x and y, the covariance of x and y is the expectation of the product of the zero offset, um, a mean offset value of, of x. So if I take the random variable x and I subtract off its expectation value, I now have a, a, a value of x that's been shifted so that its, its mean is, is zero. And then I take that and multiply it by the same thing with y, the y random variable subtracting off the uh, expectation of y. Multiply those two together, get the expectation of that, I have the covariance of x and y. The sample covariance uh, we get by uh, creating an estimator for the covariance of these random variables, x and y. Our estimator uh, for a sample will look like this. And it's like using a mean as an estimator for expectation. But we will, because we're using a sample, we're going to divide by uh, degrees of freedom number and minus 1 rather than n. So how does this relate to the correlation coefficient? The correlation coefficient is nothing more than the covariance normalized by dividing by the standard deviations in x and y. So r is a normalized, dimensionless covariance. That's just basically all it is. I take the covariance, divide by the standard deviations so that I can normalize it to always go between minus 1 and plus 1. Let's look at some properties of the covariance. Uh, if we looked at the definition and we multiplied a bunch of things out, we could easily show that the covariance of x and y is the expectation of the product of x and y minus the expectation of x times the expectation of y. If I have scalars a and b, the covariance of a random variable with a scalar is 0. The covariance of x with itself is the variance of x. Now you might be able to see why we call this a covariance. A covariance is um, how x varies with y, and a, a self-covariance is the variance. Sometimes we use um, sigma xy to represent sigma xy squared to represent the covariance just because of the um, 
similarity to sigma x. Covariance of x and y is equal to the covariance of y and x. It's perfectly symmetric. It doesn't care the order that you pick x and y. If I multiply x and y by scalars a and b, that's like multiplying the covariance by a and b. And if I offset x and y by adding scalars to x and, and y, it doesn't change the covariance at all. Finally, and this is maybe the most important property to remember about the covariance, if x and y are independent, the covariance is zero. You might see that right away. Up here, we had a property of the expectation. If x and y are independent, the expectation of x times y equals the expectation of x times the expectation of y, which of course will make this formula go to zero. And as, as we would think when we think about the nature of covariance, if x and y are independent, that means they're not varying together. They're varying independently. And there is no covariance between them. So let's review lecture number 15. What have we learned? As always, you should be able to quickly and answer these quickly and easily answer these questions. If not, you need to go back and review the material again. Explain the significance of the correlation coefficient. What does the sign of the correlation coefficient tell you? How does the covariance relate to the correlation coefficient? How does covariance relate to variance? And finally, what is the covariance of two independent random variables? Well, with this concept of covariance and the correlation coefficient in mind, in the next two lectures, we'll talk about linear regression. Till then.